you all for coming. I think you're here because you, you know this incredible story. Um, I invited Chris to do this sort of pr probably a year ago, and it's incredibly upsetting um, to hear the news this week, and, and I just wanted to be really, really sensitive to that. So unfortunately, we learned this week that one of the boys who was rescued, uh, the captain of the team, uh, uh, whose nickname is Dom, has, was in the UK at a, a football academy and sadly has died from a, a head injury. So we, we want to use this event to honor him and you know, our, our thoughts and, and prayers are, are with uh, his family and friends. So we just want to be very, very sensitive um, to that. Okay. So on the 23rd of June, uh, just over five years ago, 12 young boys from the Wild Boar football team and their assistant coach entered the Tam Luang Cave in a rural part of northern Thailand. They went into the cave several kilometers. Uh, they were messing around, probably like I would have done as a kid. Uh, they were celebrating one of the boys' birthdays. But when they turned around, you will know part of the cave was flooded and they couldn't get out. What followed over the next 17 days was one of the most challenging search and rescue operations of its kind ever attempted, and I genuinely believe one of the greatest rescues uh, ever. The story garnered international attention and significant news coverage all around the world. It captured the imagination of millions of people, and most of all, me. Uh, I was glued to the news, um, Almost from the beginning, I watched hours and hours of coverage each evening. I checked my phone constantly through the day. And my wife is in the audience. She actually got quite angry with me because I was getting a little bit uh, obsessed with the, with the story. And um, like many, I wept and wept when those boys were, were, were rescued. That story continues to fascinate people. It's been told in books. It's been told in more than 10 documentaries and films. Truth be told, I've become a little bit obsessed with the story. I've read all of the books. I've pretty much watched all of the documentaries and TVs. And in fact, this week, my wife and daughter, in fact, my daughter's in the room as well, we, we have watched two of those documentaries this week. And it's nice seeing the story through her, through her eyes. And I think there's three things that really resonated with me about this event. The first thing is, uh, I was a caver. I spent many years caving after university. Uh, I've never cave dived, but, but I was a caver. And I, I do know some cave divers personally. And I think the first thing that resonated with me was just, you know, as I watched the events, and I know quite a lot about caves, I, I honestly thought they weren't going to find those boys. And when they found them, I thought that rescue was almost impossible. The second thing that resonated with me is as many as 10,000 volunteers from all around the world, I think the estimate is about 40 different countries, um, came together. And I think there is very few things as beautiful when people set aside their differences, come together with a common goal to, to rescue these children. And then third and finally, and Chris, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but what resonated with me, I think more than anything, is that a small group of people at the very center of those events that spearheaded this rescue were very ordinary. Uh, everyday people. Although incredibly accomplished cave divers, I don't think any of you would have known about, did any of you know about Chris before? You probably would have walked by him on the street. And what I love is just these ordinary people incredibly bravely you know, in, in put their lives at risk. Um, and without them, these, you know, you know, that rescue wouldn't have happened. So I'm absolutely thrilled um, that Chris has accepted to come along and talk about these events. So please give him a hand and um, welcome him to the stage. Okay, um, thank you, Chris, for coming. Thank so you. So just very briefly, um, and I want to make sure we have some time at the end for questions, but just tell us a little bit about uh, where you're from, where did you grow up? Yeah. So I grew up in Hertfordshire, so very near London. Um, I had a, I suppose a pretty good upbringing. I had a chance to you know, be in the Boy Scouts and have sort of adventurous uh, activities. Um, but it wasn't until um, a few years later I found myself at uh, university here in Southampton where I first joined and tried, I uh, joined the caving club and got to try going underground and, you know, really found that environment sort of, you know, worked for me and I absolutely loved it and became 
obsessed and sort of addicted to, to caving. So that was my second question then. So you obviously studied here. Tell us, tell us what you studied to start with and, and also maybe tell us a bit about how was your time in Southampton? Yeah, um, so I was here uh, in the year, I guess what was year 2000. Um, I spent four years here, um, did an undergraduate degree uh, in management science and then went on and did one year's uh, master's in information systems. Uh, so I'm a bit of a, bit of a geek. Um, so yeah, I work in IT now uh, on the back of, uh, of that MSc. Um, so yeah, so I was here for four years, um, had a fantastic time, really enjoyed the university um, and found you know, the city, etc. very, very welcoming. Um, and of course, all the wonderful clubs that were part of the, the Students' Union um, were at my disposal. Um, in the first year I was here, I actually joined the OTC, Officer Training Corps, so it's part of the Territorial Army, um, and that gave me a chance to sort of run around and get muddy in a field and uh, sleep in a ditch and do all those sort of adventurous things uh, of weekends, um, and I found that great fun. Uh, and then in my second year, um, I discovered the Caving Club. I went to what was then called, or maybe still called, the Bun Fight. Is that still the case? Yeah, but nothing good. So I went to the Bun Fight, wandering around the stalls and you know, talking to all the people at the various stands. And, um, and I found this club called the Caving Club. And I said, oh, I fancy, I fancy giving this a go. Um, you know, what, what's it about and, and all the rest of it. And they gave, I guess they did a, a reasonable sales pitch because um, I signed up uh, and they took me on what they call a freshers trip. Uh, so, you know, we left Southampton in a minibus and went over to the Mendip Hills. Um, which is uh, part of Somerset. Uh, it's actually where I live now, so I live in, in Somerset um, near the Mendip Hills. And uh, we went to a small cave called Lionel's Hole in Burlington Coombe. And uh, I had to put all this, you know, clobber on, this kind of oversuit and helmet and wellies, etc. And So you brought a few around. things I, I here a with few you things. now? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Obviously back then it was all borrowed from the club. Um, now I've got my own gear, obviously. Um, but yeah, and I, I just fell in love with, uh, with, with the whole thing. And I fell in love with the sport of caving. But I also fell in love with the caving community, the people in, involved in the, the sport, you know. The, the way so we have a few cavers with us today. Can you just give us a, a shout? Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Excellent. And just very quickly, so you lived in Glenair Halls and That's then I right. think later on on Alma Road. That's right, we yeah. got any Alma Road residents here today? Oh, one. There we go. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought half of the students lived on Alma Road, but yeah. Um, so. Yeah, so you obviously got into caving, it's nice to know. And uh, have we got the president of the caving club here today? Not down today, but you were the president um, for a year, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, as with many, um, you know, university clubs and societies, you know, you, you come to that moment, you think we need a new committee, and you're going, well, who's keen? Right, who can we, tw whose arms can we twist? And uh, I guess I didn't step backwards fast enough, so I found myself being <laughs> volunteered. Uh, for the Caven Club president. Um, but that was good, you know, and I, I really enjoyed it and organised trips for the club uh, to sort of the UK Caven region. So we spent a lot of time going to the Mendip Hills because that's obviously fairly nearby, a couple of hours away. Um, but there are also caves further afield in South Wales um, or the Peak District. So if you're going up north a little bit and going further up north to the, to the Yorkshire Dales, um, where there are some, some spectacular caves and in particular big vertical cave systems. Um, and I was, I suppose, mentored and looked after by the existing members of the, the club. Yeah. Um, you know, they took me under their wing. They showed me the techniques to use when going caving. They taught me uh, the ver various sort of vertical um, techniques in terms of abseiling down ropes and going back up, up and down ropes. Um, so I picked up everything through the club. Um, yeah, and they really looked after me and, and gave me that, that thrill for caving. So you got into caving? So how about the diving? And mm. we do have some members of the University Dive Society here, I think. Give us a shout. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, so yeah, how did you get into diving? And then how did you put caving and diving yeah. together? So actually, I, um, I learned to dive with the OTC, with Officer Training Corps. So um, at the back end of that first year, uh, there was an opportunity to go to learn to dive in the UK and then go and take those skills and go on a foreign overseas trip. Now, obviously, the OTC is all about expeditions and very sort of serious military things. Um, but we did have a very nice holiday on a Red Sea liverboard. And we were told it, could, it was not a holiday, shh, it was an expedition. Um, but it was very good. And I got to go diving every day, th uh, three or four times a day, including a night dive um, from this wonderful uh, kind of boat in the Red Sea with the you know, crystal clear water and corals and, and, and absolutely everything. So I learned to dive in fantastic you know, conditions and, and thought, I really like this diving thing. Um, but when I came back uh, to the UK and started my, my second year, I sort of put diving on hold for a little bit, um, started caving, and then I did join uh, the University Diving Club. 
um, got a dry suit and started to swim around in some of the murkier, colder waters uh, in the UK. Uh, and I had a bit of a taste for it. Um, but I very much kept the two sports separate at that point. So most weekends I was caving because that became my real passion. And every so often I'd do one of the university diving trips just to kind of keep my hand in. Uh, and so, the, you know, I was doing little bits with, with both sports. Um, but I knew that I had a real passion and love for diving, for being, a love for being underwater. And I think even at that point, I had an ambition that I would one day do cave diving. You know, I could, I could see the way in which the sports could, would come together for me. Um, but I really enjoyed diving. And um, when I left university, I explored the opportunity to go overseas and do a bit of an internship, so a diving internship. So I actually went to the Costa del Sol, and I uh, worked there as a, effectively a dive master eventually, um, where you're guiding members of the public. Uh, you're also doing the kind of donkey work. You're kind of hosing down the cylinders and washing the equipment and fitting your customers out with wetsuits. So I basically worked a summer season uh, in the dive industry uh, in Spain. At the end of that season, uh, I was actually able to uh, complete my instructor's exam and became a, a paddy open water scuba instructor. So I could teach open water diving. I thought, I know quite a bit about diving. You, you think you know quite a bit, you don't really at that point. Um, and then I, but I knew I loved a lot about, I loved caving. And when I came back um, from working in Spain, uh, I got a, a sort of a, a proper job, my kind of corporate job. I managed to have a bit of money suddenly. And I could actually afford to start buying my own diving equipment. And that's when I became and started to become a cave diver and began that process of, of training up for, for cave diving. Okay. So, you know, paint a picture to the audience. Sort of what is it like being in a cave diving? Because, you know, uh, 15 years ago, my wife and I went to Mexico. Incredibly massive caves the size of this. You're swimming through the most beautiful crystal clear water. But, but in my experience, you know, the first cave I did was Swildens. You know, it's a muddy puddle, yeah. uh, zero visibility. And uh, I think to this day, one of my favorite ever caving trips was the, the round trip in Swildens. And there's this section called the Narrows, which at the time I loved it. Now that I'm actually a bit old, it sort of sends shivers down my, my spine. But you, you must have been through the Narrows. But it's, it's three sections of cave, I don't know, eight meters long each one or something. But you, you get to the first section of cave, um, and it's a tiny hole about this big, completely underwater. And you, you spend an hour bailing the water out with buckets. And you have an airspace of a few centimeters. And you know, I remember lying on my back. Um, you've got the wall on one side, the wall on the other side, the wall here on your head. And you're inching your way through this cave with the, the water lapping your ears, lapping into your mouth if you're not careful. And, and um, you do that with air tanks on underwater, maybe not quite as extreme but yeah just sorry yeah. tell us a little bit about yeah. what it's what, what it's like but it's it's i think it's different to how some people imagine imagine right. this cave diving so, in the uk certainly. so so that's it isn't it C cave diving your experience of cave diving totally depends on where you go and dive yeah. right where, yeah. where, where you cave dive um you know if you find if you google cave diving i'm sure some of the first hits will be the beautiful crystal clear underwater caves in mexico or in florida that make it look spectacular and and looks it's quite easy just swimming around in a nice crystal clear pool. Um, but the reality is, unfortunately, we don't have large crystal clear cave systems uh, in the UK. Um, our geology and geography doesn't, doesn't lend itself to, to creating those sorts of caves. So what we tend to have is um, extensive caves, which a caver, and I you know, started out as a caver, would, would go down and then you'd reach a section of that dry cave that would then be flooded, as you've described. So the water would come up to the, to the roof. And the only way for cavers to progress it was those cavers to become divers. So actually most cave divers in the UK start out as cavers and they become cave divers because they're interested in going further in these caves. Actually their prim primary skill is in being a caver and you need both the you know, physical and technical skills to access the dive site in the first place as well as the sort of, if you like, mental ability to deal with small spaces. Used to dealing with small spaces in the dry, as it were, not, not with diving kit on. And once you get used to going through a dry squeeze, then actually perhaps it becomes a lot more feasible to imagine doing that same sort of thing yeah. underwater and so on. So yeah, absolutely, you've started out as a caver and it's that transformation from caver to cave diver. Yeah. Um, and in the UK, you're, you're right, it's about typically uh, the caves can have very poor visibility. Uh, typically the caves can, ha can be very constricted. So you might be wriggling uh, through a small passage underwater, um, sometimes 
you know, barely being able to see your, your hand in front of your face. So do go on YouTube. Um, Chris has a channel there, and there's a really interesting clip of him in Wookiee Hole. Yep. And it is terrifying, you know, squeezing through this now thing, literally digging the gravel out, pushing your tanks ahead of you. Ha have a look at that. I highly recommend that. So before, obviously, we get on to Thailand, um, just tell us, what, what do you do now? You, you're obviously not a full-time cave diver. What, no. you know, how do you make your yeah. living? So, so I'm an IT consultant, or I've got, I'm, I manage a team of IT consultants. So uh, the company I work for delivers uh, and implements uh, finance and accounting systems. So uh, yeah, when I'm not caving and cave diving, I'm talking to accountants and FDs and financial controllers about the debits and credits and how they make the software do them. So uh, yeah, very different uh, to caving and cave diving. And actually, I quite, I quite enjoy, I suppose, the contrast um, having, if you like, an adventurous personal life and perhaps a more traditional, expected kind of corporate life uh, elsewhere. And I enjoy the challenges that both of them, both yeah. them represent. Yeah. It's nice that you can do the two together. Yeah, and yeah. OK, so that brings us obviously up to the events of June 2018. So this was the last photo, I think, taken by, by the boys before they uh, entered into the cave. So there's 12 boys aged between 11 and 16 at the time, and their 25-year-old assistant coach, Coach Eek. Um, so this is the last photo of them taken. So from what I you know, have, they, they were practicing football. It was one of their birthdays. They decided to go into the cave, yeah. uh, have some fun. So let's just have a quick look at, can you see that clearly? Let's have a look, quick look at where the cave is located. So we're in the NOC there, thanks to Zunka for helping me do this in animation. So we're going to zoom out. Um, so it's quite a remote part of northern Thailand, right on the border with Myanmar. Um, and that is the cave system there. Um, it's got a very big entrance, but soon narrows. And this is uh, sort of one of the maps. So what did you, kn did you know anything at all about the cave before these events happened? No. So I hadn't heard the cave. Um, um, interestingly, though, as soon as I started to speak to my friends locally um, about what was happening, um, it became apparent that um, this cave had been explored and mapped by a British team. And actually, even just Googling the kind of, you know, the, the name of the cave, you'd find surveys, I, I maps, produced by that team. Um, and that team uh, is a team of cave explorers, largely part of a caving club near where I live called the Shepton Mallet Caving Club. And some of my friends had actually been on the trips where they'd been going to this cave and exploring it and mapping it. Um, one of those explorers uh, actually lives in Thailand as an expat, Vern Unsworth. Yeah. And Vern was teaming up with the UK guys who were you know, flying out for sort of a two or three week uh, expedition to explore and map these caves. So this cave was, was well known actually to a group of, of, of UK uh, cavers, but of course they'd always seen this cave in the dry season. Um, they'd only ever seen it when it was, as you know, that first picture demonstrates, you know, completely, completely devoid of water and, uh, and a great caving trip to go to the end and, and kind of find a new passage. Vern, as the local uh, expert here, had of course seen the cave in all seasons. You know, he'd been there, you know, the, the whole year round and seen the monsoon season. He knew that, you know, the dangers that the monsoon um, represented and quite, and he was able to predict how the cave would react to that onset of rain. Yeah. So we've got a, a map there. So... Um, from what I've read, it's about 10 kilometers in co total, but it's got the two arms there, the T junction. So the boys, um, you know, walked into the cave, went up the right passage, but then when they came back, uh, obviously the T junction was, um, was flooded. Yeah, so you've got two water courses here, two ways that water enters the cave system. Um, and because of the geography and geology, uh, one of them reacts faster. Uh, so the boys, as you say, were on the way back trying to get out of the cave, found that water had collected at that T-junction section. That's also one of the lowest sections of the cave. So water will build up there mo most quickly. Yeah. Um, they tried to get out, found their way blocked, and had to retreat deeper into the cave system in order to seek some refuge. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what I wanted to do now quickly is let's just... I'm sure you, you've also seen some of the documentaries, but let's just whip through some of the events quickly and then come back, Chris, and, uh, and ask you uh, about them. So on the 23rd of June, day one, the boys sort of entered the cave. Um, the rescue operation sort of uh, gathered quite quickly, but it wasn't until sort of day three that the Navy SEALs came in and tried to enter the cave, but, you know, conditions were, were, were fairly uh, horrendous. 
Um, Rick Stanton and John Blanthram, we'll talk about them in a minute. Uh, they arrived from the British Cave Rescue Council. Correct. Got it right that time. Um, that was day five, but we'll, we'll come back and revisit all of these. So let's just whip through the events quickly. On the 28th of June, day six, very heavy rain, um, put a, a stop to the rescue for the time being. Um, and day eight, the search resumed. And it wasn't just John and Rick, but there was other divers. We, we can talk about that, you know, trying to get into the tr cave, trying to lay line. We, we, we will come on to that. And it wasn't until day 10 that the boys were found. And we, we will see a, a clip of that video. I'm sure you've all seen it. And then it wasn't until day 11 that the boys actually received some food. Um, um, sadly, uh, Navy, ex-Navy SEAL Sam Man Kuman dies. Uh, we'll, we'll come on to that. And then eventually over a three-day period, the, 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 the boys were rescued. So that's just a, a, a timeline of the event. So around 17 to 18 days. So let's go back to the, uh, the beginning here. So when, when did you find out this was happening? Because it was, even on the news here, we, we didn't really find out. And, yeah. Till you, you know a few days in, it sort of started quite slowly, and um, yeah. So when did you know that yeah, things it's, were, it's, were? It's interesting how these things build, um, and we've seen we've seen before before Thailand, and subsequently, um, quite often, um, we, the British Cave Rescue Council, or, or individual members, become aware of events unfolding either in the UK or overseas through personal contacts or through media reports. So um, I think. Uh, so Rick and John first became aware of the problem um, out in Thailand when Vern contacted them. Um, but that was before, way before any official communication had been made. Um, and then at which point you start to be able to find things online in local news agencies and so on. At the point that Rick and John started to think seriously about the fact that there might be a formal request for them to go, they contacted me to, to let me know that was going to happen as well as they were contacting everybody involved in uh, the BCRC. So it should be clear. Um, in order for a UK search and rescue team, which is what um, the British Cave Rescue um, uh, organisations are, um, to leave you know, the UK and operate in a foreign jurisdiction, um, the UK government needs to have um, received an official request through the appropriate dip diplomatic channel. So it's not a question of, you know, Vern rigging Rick and John and them flying out of their own back. It had to be coordinated and, and you know, arranged properly. So those informal lines of communication be quite quick. You know, you can get told, hey, something's happening in here. But actually getting the proper paperwork and authority signed off um, can take a, a lot of work. So a lot of people working behind the scenes from the BCRC, from the, from the Cave Rescue Organization, as well as um, the Thai Embassy in the UK and the British Embassy over in Bangkok, trying to coordinate things and get the right approvals in place uh, so that Rick and John could, could fly out. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about um, Rick and John. What are, they, what are they like? Had you known them for a, a yeah. number of years before? Yeah. So, so the cave diving community in the UK in particular is fa fairly small, particularly cave divers who come from that caving background first and foremost and are part of the you know, caving, caving clubs and caving community. So uh, I knew both of them um, pretty well. Um, I've been on uh, a number of trips um, with both of them as well as Jason who flew out with me. Um, so we'd caved together quite a bit, um, and they were, of course, big personalities in the cave diving world in the UK as well. So um, we had a good, a good relationship. Um, I had been, uh, sorry, I, I say I am the British Caving, uh, BCRC's British uh, Caving Rescue Council's uh, diving liaison officer, and I've been in that post for a number of years. So for a number of years, I've been supporting the efforts of cave rescue and cave diving um, sort of from that sort of political so you were part of the, the council bef before the, the rescue. Ex exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Rick, John and Jason had been deployed overseas on a number of occasions prior to Thailand. And I'd been, uh, you know, in the sort of diving officer in the UK supporting those deployments, um, you know, from a sort of political perspective. Yeah. So tell us a bit, obviously, before you came out, but, you know, tell us a bit of what were conditions like in the cave, well, you obviously got to experience it, but in those early days, as John and Richard are trying to, so, well, maybe tell us a little bit about this and what what this would have been useful by by Ron, uh, Rick, and John. So, so, so this is a bit of uh, cave diving line. So this is a line reel. So you can tell by the rudimentary construction, um, it's a homemade uh, item. Um, it's the uh, the bit of plastic reel that you go if you go to B and Q. 
um, at the end of the, you know, you get to the, the aisle that's got the chain on and the kind of bits of string and things, and you go there just at the end of, when they've almost run out, you can buy the last bit of chain or whatever it is, and they give you the plastic reel, if you ask nicely. So that used to be my regular source of cave diving reels, and then you can get a bit of pipe, put that through and make a, make a reel. Um, this contains string. In this case, it's um, about four millimetre thick, uh, white, white kind of nylon string. Um, you can choose your, choose your line depending on your cave, so thicker line for poor visibility, typically. Um, but Rick and John would have thrown out with some line, probably not similar to this, um, that they could lay in the cave uh, and, and, you know, and use to follow. Um, because they were working and diving with the Thai Navy SEALs, Thai Navy SEALs actually wanted them to install a much thicker um, kind of uh, line uh, and actually it was a, basically a climbing rope, a sort of a 9 or 10 mil climbing rope. Uh, a 9 or 10 mil climbing rope, won't, of course, won't go around a reel like that. So actually Rick and John had to lay their line from a big bag, like a big poly bag, effectively like a big sack, and pull it out as they, as they go. So that was, that was very difficult. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's challenging for a number of reasons, and not least kind of managing that amount of that sort of this big bag as you're, as you're swimming underwater. But that it sounded mean... fairly, fairly horrendous in terms of the currents and talk about the sort of mask almost being washed away. And yeah. Yeah. But very yeah. difficult conditions. And, you know, I was back in the UK getting updates from them, um, you know, and in those early days, um, you know, I think there was, a, there was a lack of hope or belief that it would be possible to locate the boys to really get very far in the cave. Um, or, you know, or, or certainly, you know, and certainly no thoughts of any kind of potential for doing a, a rescue. Um, it was described to me um, as a very gnarly cave dive. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so then, you know, came the absolutely incredible news. To, I'm sure you all remember it of, of when the boys were, were, were found. Um, we'll come back to this in, in a second. Obviously, the, this is a photo I think you took. Um, sounds like pretty horrendous weather, lots and lots of rain. I think you see that on the uh, on the documentary. But this is the you know moment. I think this video has probably been watched more than almost any other uh, video. But this is the beautiful moment that um, Rick and John found the boys. Do, tell us a little bit about that, and you know, have you spoken to them about that moment? Yeah, absolutely. And, it's uh, you know from my perspective on it was that um, I remember I was at work at the time. Um, when the news filtered out that they'd found the boys. Now, you know, the, it, there was a, a bit of a news story at this point, um, you know, before they located the boys. Um, I was, you know, I was work, but I was working, I was able to be helping the BCRC out, you know, in spare time. And generally I had, you know, sort of semi, semi-normal existence. Um, as soon as Rick and John found the boys, of course, this became a huge story. Um, and the interest in it just multiplied. Uh, so, yeah, as the BCRC diving officer, my name was, and my number was one of the numbers giving out, being given out by the BCRC team as part of a series of press releases about what was happening. So I remember being in the office trying to work with a colleague and my phone would just not stop, stop ringing because there were journalists all over the world desperate to try and speak to somebody to get some perspective on, on what was going on out there. Um, and our, our answer at that point was, was actually you know, relatively um, sort of straightforward in the sense that well, yes, they found the boys, but we had to try and make it very clear to the world's press and media that just because they found the boys did not mean there would be, it would be a straightforward or, or, or easy rescue. Um, we made it very, very clear that the hard work was still yet to be done. Um, none of us in Cave Rescue at that point had any idea or any clue how on earth those boys could be brought out alive. We wanted to stress that as much as possible to people on the media that you know, this was still a very serious problem and that you know, any sort of uh, over early kind of celebrations um, were, you know, were, were mistimed. Um, we had to do that in a sensitive way, uh, of course, because everybody was, uh, was excited at, at the potential here. Yeah. Um, but that demand by that 24-7 uh, news and, and media um, kind of industry is really quite insatiable. Yeah. Uh, so it was right for us to put up hopefully credible spokespeople to provide some commentary, because otherwise they will just keep chasing down anybody who can offer an opinion on something and you have you know, pseudo experts speculating endlessly. So yeah. I think it's right if you're part of an organization to find and agree on a proper statement, um, which we did as BCRC, and present, you know, present that information and kind of stick to the story and just keep repeating that. So before we talk about the sort of rescue, so day 10, they find the boys. When did you then come out to Thailand and how did that process of getting to Thailand sort of happen? So after uh, Rick and John had found the boys, um, there was an initial sort of surge of enthusiasm. 
uh, and the Thai um, authorities at that point, you know, in charge of the rescue, said actually we want the, the British diver to take a step back. We think that now we've got the Navy SEAL team, they can actually, you know, sort of go into the cave and, and conduct a rescue. Um, the Navy SEALs um, went into the cave. Uh, they sent in, uh, in effect, six uh, Navy SEALs who swam to the end of the cave. Um, but they had such a, a difficult journey reaching the boys that by the time they got there, they had consumed a large amount of the air supplies that they'd taken with them to get into the cave. So much so, there was only sufficient air for two of the six to return and come back to, to surface. Uh, the two that came back said to their commander, look, you know, this is beyond the capabilities and experience of the Navy SEALs. You know, incredibly brave um, divers, incredibly brave people to go into an environment like that which they weren't trained for. Um, you know, they're not expert cave divers. And that's probably the thing to highlight here is the expertise involved in cave diving is very different to the expertise involved in military diving and combat diving, which of course is what they were, were trained for. Um, so at that point, renewed interest in using the British cave divers, um, you know, was established. Um, I've been in contact with Rick and John. They'd actually said at one point they might even be coming home and I've gone, oh, well, okay, that's, you know, we'll just see what happens. And then suddenly I get a phone call saying everything's changed. The ties would now li like us to take a leading role in bringing the boys out. Um, we'd like you to come out uh, along with Jason. So I've been doing a lot of diving with Jason Mallinson. So obviously we've got Rick at the top. Uh, so an ex-firefighter, John is, yep. I think, an IT consultant Correct. from... Uh, tell us a bit about Jason very quickly. So Jason is a rope access technician. Um, so Jason's kind of swinging around on the you know, end of a rope, uh, looking at buildings, inspecting buildings, and training people to, to do the same. Uh, he and I have been on a number of expeditions together, uh, including some expeditions that I'd organized and led, uh, including a big expedition to uh, Mexico in 2013. And I think on the back of that, we'd established a really good rapport and kind of working relationship. Uh, so yeah, I certainly look up to Jason, and you know, he's certainly been a bit of a kind of a mentor um, for me, and we've done a lot of diving together. And when Rick and John had gone out to Thailand, he'd said, um, Rick had said to me, look, you know, you need to be on standby along with Jason. And it was very clear that, you know, if they needed further assistance, we'd probably be the next two people to fly out from the UK uh, and go and join them. So you flew out? I assume you just drove yourself to the airport, did you? Did you... So, so I got the phone call at about six in the morning. Um, and John said, you need to be on the flight tonight. There's typically a flight every night going from uh, Heathrow to Bangkok, and that's the flight to be on. Um, obviously, because of the time zone differences, it was sort of late in the day in Thailand when John, John phoned me. Um, I had to get everything ready. So it can take me days and days, usually, to pack for a cave expedition. I had just a handful of hours. Um, I then needed to get someone to give me a lift to the airport. Uh, some of my diving equipment actually was um, inaccessible. It was uh, stashed and staged for some future diving trips I had planned uh, in Wookie Hole. So I wasn't able to get that diving equipment. So I was also then having to borrow uh, some gear. Um, fortunately, my wife is also a cave diver. So it made it quite easy to say, Laura, uh, can I borrow some of your regulators? Uh, I'm off to Thailand. Um, so yeah, so I had uh, my friend Connor and my friend Gavin actually came to my house. I said, look, I need help packing, guys. You just, you know, like, yeah, no problem. So they, they showed up, took time off work, and just helped me pack. And Gavin uh, drove me to the airport. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we flew. And we flew out with, uh, and you might imagine at this point, if you're joining a large international rescue, there would be everything you'd need as, you know, as a rescue diver. But I was told by John, under no, certain, under no circumstances, if you need something, you need to bring it with you. Yeah. Um, so all of, and I said, what, even lead? He said, yes, even lead. It's sort of been, yeah, no, no, bring your lead. If you need lead to sink, bring it with you. Do not assume you get yeah. here, those will be led around. And of course, when you've got that many people yeah. trying to dive, yeah. actually some of the resources get scarce. So yeah. divers' lead might yeah. have been scarce. Um, we flew out with a certain number of diving cylinders. We yeah. flew out with line reels and, and all the things that we might possibly need or want. So we threw out, <coughs> Jason and I flew out with something like 350 kilos of baggage. Yeah between the two of us, it's quite good. Um, assuming they didn't charge there you for that? No excess baggage <laughs> charge. Um, whether that was passed on to the Thai government, I, I'm yet to know. But, uh, yeah. So I'm just conscious of time now, I do want to allow, but, but so what, just very quickly, what was it like when you got there? Was it in, insane? Is, I mean, 10,000 people, all the I, locals? I, I think things had got a little bit more under control by the time Jason and I joined the team. Uh, you know, the press were now cordoned off. Uh, it was possible for the um, for our kind of emergency escort to get us through the cordon, yeah. um, but even even so, even throughout throughout my stay in the rescue, occasionally you know our, our minibus will get stuck behind 
you know, some press person or some other person and, you know, we'd get a bit irate and say, look, you need to get us through. And, yeah. you know, so it, it was difficult, I imagine, for the authorities to control that many people to have the various sections and areas, maintain some kind of perimeter and some kind of security. Yeah. Obviously, the press can be quite invasive and they have to yeah. do quite a lot to kind of maintain them and keep them off site, yeah. as, as well as actually providing food and infrastructure for all those people. Yeah. So, you know, kitchens were thrown up, you know, you could sort of, almost like a little village with its own infrastructure was there yeah. um, to, to support everybody. So I'd like to spend, you know, a good 10 minutes talking about the, the rescue and so many different options were, were discussed, some absolutely insane, um, some sensible, but just before we get onto that, you know, there's, I think, 90 divers in total, but obviously another key, the, the four of you were very key, and, and Richard Harris, uh, uh, yeah. an Australian. So did you know Richard before? Tell us a, a little so, bit about... So, so, as I say, the cave diving community is quite small. I'd not met um, Harry, so Dr. Dr. Harris, uh, known as Harry, um, but I certainly knew of him. Um, he'd been on uh, trips with a number of people that I knew um, fairly well. Um, I've been on a couple of trips um, with some, um, a, a, a cave diver based in Tasmania and had done a number of trips with, with Harry. So we had lots of mutual friends. We'd never actually met and had the opportunity to, to yeah. dive together. Um, he is an anaesthetist, yeah. which is obviously key to the story here. Uh, and because he was persuaded um, by Rick to come out and attempt uh, sedation, I making the boys you know, completely unconscious uh, using, uh, you know, using uh, anaesthetics. Um, so that the boys could be transported out of the cave. So absolutely a key person. And of course, he had to take on the uh, medical risk, if you like, of recommending this treatment um, and believing that he could do this. Um, you know, as the divers bring the boys out, we had responsibility for, I suppose, the physical safety of those boys. But I guess he had the medical responsibility for having made the decisions, you know, prepared the, the, you know, the drugs that were going to be used, um, you know, and, and took that responsibility of delivering them in the cave initially. Yeah. So tell us then over the next sort of three or four days, how did the rescue evolve? How did you, you know, eventually the four of you, you know, uh, Harris, yeah. uh, anaesthetized the boys, we, we can come on to that, but how, tell us how things evolved. And I, I don't think we need to spend too much time on this, but Elon Musk uh, showed up in there, uh, in there somewhere as well, but um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, you know, by the time I joined, um, the time Jason and I had, had arrived in Thailand, the idea of sedation had, had been sort of discussed a little bit. And, and Rick was obviously building this idea at, at the back of his mind about how it, how it might work. But it was interesting, um, you know, I, I guess this was a developing idea. I remember flying out from Heathrow and someone had, I got a text message saying, we, we might sedate the boys. And I went, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting, you know. And I said to my friend Gavin, I might sedate the boys. He said, yeah, you know, sometimes people use beta blockers if they're a bit scared of going caving. That might be a way that you might get coax somebody through something they're scared of. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So the back of my mind, this idea that perhaps the boys might be a bit woozy and they might be a bit drugged up so we perhaps could, could, could move them more easily through the cave. It's only really when Jason and I were, were there, you know, in person with, with Rick and John that it became clear. I remember saying to Rick, so, so to just, you know, what are the boys going to be like? Are they going to be, un it's like, they're completely unconscious. Yeah. That's the plan. And I think it was that moment where Jason and I were like, oh, okay, that's the plan, completely unconscious. Um, and so, yeah, this idea developed. Um, you know, uh, Harry had come out with the view that this could be attempted. Um, he had to persuade the Thai authorities that this plan could be tried safely, or at least that it was a, a reasonable risk to take. Um, the strategy then of how we would actually move the boys through the cave uh, came down to Rick, John, Jason and myself to think about. We uh, reasoned that um, each of the boys would have a cylinder, each of the boys would then have use what's called a full face mask, which is a mask that entirely encloses uh, the, the user's face. And that full face mask would mean that the boys wouldn't have to bite into a regulator um, because they'd be unconscious. Um, that full face mask would also be a special type of mask called a positive pressure mask that constantly pushes air inwards. So if you knock the edge of that mask, rather than water go in, air will come out and that air pushes any water out. Um, there were some of these masks available in, in Thailand. Um, and then we had to devise a system of mounting the cylinder and the mask on the boys. Yeah. And what we actually did is we had the cylinder mounted on the chest of the boys. Okay. So most typical images you'll see of people diving involve a cylinder on their back, right? That's, that's typical. And of course, any cartoons and diagrams at the time would have shown the boys with these cylinders on their backs. Um, but in uh, UK cave diving, chest mounting a cylinder is more common because you can move it out of the way and get through small spaces. 
So we did that um, with various bungee straps that could secure the cylinder uh, and hold that in place. And then each of the boys had that full face mask. So just before, you know, a few days before the rescue, very sadly, uh, one of the ex-Navy SEALs who had volunteered to be there, Sam Man Goonman, died. So just tell us a little bit about, obviously, that's a horrible situation. Yeah. You're trying to prepare the rescue, but... So um, Sam Man actually died the evening that Jason arrived in Thailand. So, uh, so we'd flown in. Uh, we met uh, Rick and John and had a bit of a, a, a briefing. Um, we looked at some of the equipment that we might use um, to bring the boys out and had some discussions um, about what the plans would be for the next few days. Um, and then, you know, we, we left site and, you know, we had an attempt at sleeping and getting over our, our jet lag. When we came back in the following morning, we learned that one of the Navy SEALs had died that, that evening. And as you say, an absolutely uh, tragic uh, event and a reminder to everybody involved in the rescue just how dangerous and high risk cave diving was. And I think... Um, Probably from the perspective of the Thai authorities in charge of the rescue at this point, it was a timely reminder of just how risky this was and how important it was to have specialist cave diving training rather than just the sort of yeah. general diving training and bravery that, that, that the SEALs uh, exhibited. So we don't know in detail what killed him. When there are diving accidents, it's not uncommon for the, the cause. I mean, the cause is effectively running out of air which is what happened here. What we don't know is why he ran out of air, what delayed his departure from the cave and meant that he ran out of air. Yeah, yeah. No, very, very sad. So one of the things I found really interesting as you're preparing for the event is you did some practices in a pool. Um, so maybe you could just very yeah. briefly tell us, tell us about that. And, Absolutely. Yeah. So we'd, we'd come up with this system, this idea of this front-mounted cylinder and these full-face masks. Um, We'd managed to obtain some relatively small wetsuits that we thought would work and, and fit on the boys. Um, and then we had these uh, military swimmers' vests to provide a form of buoyancy. Um, so we borrowed those from the Navy SEALs. But we'd never put this equipment together in this particular configuration. Um, and we'd certainly never tried to propel somebody else through the water with this arrangement on. So we needed someone to practice with it. Um, so we asked for that, and a uh, nearby uh, swimming pool was suggested. Uh, and there were some boys that were part of a local swimming team, and uh, they were volunteered for us to practice on. Um, we, we didn't sedate these. They were all conscious, <laughs> I just like to, like to stress. Um, but yeah, we swam around, around this swimming pool. And you know, for me personally, it was really important to get into the water to try and imagine doing this, ac this action, this yeah. physical action uh, in a cave. You know, how would I actually propel another human being? Where could I hold them? What could I push on? What could I twist? What could I turn? Um, you know, and we worked out quite quickly, you could hold the back of their harness, you could hold them in below you. You might use a bit of your weight to actually bring them down, so you need to kind of go down in the cave, you could do that. But also by holding them underneath you in the cave, it would mean that um, if we hit the ceiling, I would hit the ceiling, rather than the boys hitting the yeah. ceiling. Yeah. And, you know, I had my helmet on, obviously, so I could see what I was doing to protect my head, but the boys in that full face mask, and not really much to kind of protect the, the tops yeah. of their heads. So it was important for us to keep them below us and kind of yeah. in against us so we could go through those small spaces. And you dived in to see the boys before the, the rescue, isn't it? What, what was that like, sort of meeting them in, in, yeah. in so, this chamber? So that, so that was interesting. That was my first day of activity in Thailand, exactly as you say, was diving in um, to the cave. So, you know, partly that was for me to understand the layout of the cave, to, uh, you know, to see the conditions for myself. Um, to be used to some of the difficulties with the route. The route was fairly tortuous in places, in places... So I was we going were... to ask you a bit about the route. Mm. So they're about four kilometres in. How much of that was flooded? How much of that was dry? Yeah. How much of that was constricted? Yeah. So the first section of cave we were able to walk through for a long, long distance to what we call chamber, chamber yeah. three. So diving operations began at chamber three. Um, and from chamber three, it was about a kilometre and a half to the point that the boys uh, were, were stuck and, and, and waiting. Uh, for that kilometre and a half distance, about 50% of the time we were completely submerged and swimming underwater. The rest of the time we were effectively swimming on the surface of an underground river. Yeah. So the river's coming towards you all the time, you're swimming upstream against that flow. When you're underwater, that flow isn't too noticeable, but when you're on the surface, that flow is quite hard to swim against. Yeah. Um, and then every so often you get to a submerged section and have to dive again. Uh, the line that was laid was laid uh, in long sections, and that meant it would often run around the corners and go through uh, difficult areas where you'd find yourself trying to work out how to get through a small hole and having to pull the line to one side and wriggle through. Yeah. 
I'm just conscious of time, but so many questions. Um, so let's. So, what was it like getting to the cave with Harry, him sedating him, and you know, particularly on that first time taking that boys out? I mean, we spoke a bit about this last night, but I'm guessing you <laughs> you try within your mind, you, you know, to distance yourself a bit from the events but just tell us what it was like you know particularly yeah. that first dive you've you've got this precious cargo you, you describe it in the rescue it, it, yeah. what was that like yeah I mean I think probably the first thing to say is I remember walking into the cave on that on that first day you know Jason myself Rick, Rick and John um you know going up to, to chamber three to start the start the dive and um and really you know I had, had a number of things going through my head um you know probably the, the first one I was thinking well what's What's the risk to my personal safety here? Yeah. You know, it's always important. If you're a rescuer, you need to not become another casualty. So what's the risk to my personal safety? And, and actually, I reasoned at this point that I was quite comfortable with the diving. Yeah. And I actually thought the biggest risk to myself was actually the risk of the mental trauma should something I do go, go wrong or should, should this not work out. And, uh, and I had to consider, was I prepared to take that risk? Did I think I could live with um, whatever trauma would, would happen after the event? If it wasn't successful, would I be, you know, would I be resilient enough to deal with that? Would I be able to cope with that and go through whatever counselling and so on? So yeah. that was uh, an important milestone for me in terms of thinking I'm prepared to do this and take that risk and, and understanding that it was very personal. It would yeah. be about me and what I would have to live with. Yeah. Um, so I guess that was the first thing. And then the second thing really was about how I would 